Hi, I'm Hillary Fleck, the Collection Manager at the Monroe County History Center, and thank you for joining me today for How Do I Preserve This, our first live stream virtual program. Um, we had several uh, entries of asking how to preserve their family treasures, and so we decided we would do a virtual program like this to um, give some tips and pointers about how um, to preserve your family documents, photographs, quilts, textiles, wedding dresses, toys, all kinds of things. So um, we're going to talk about a wide range of things today very briefly, but um, I hope that this will give you a good base um, to go off of. And then there are other resources that we have um, on that will be linked to in the, um, in the notes. And um, so you can look for supplies and other um, information to help you preserve your items that if you have further questions. And as always, you're free to feel free to contact me here at the History Center. Um, so what do I do at the History Center? I am the collections manager, which means that I care for the artifacts in the museum's collection. There are over 70,000 individual items in the museum's collection. And what I do is called preventive conservation. So I am not a conservation scientist. I do not handle chemicals at all. Um, what I do is preventive conservation. And so in maintaining an environment and a um, relative humidity, I mitigate all of the things that can cause an item to deteriorate, break down, um, disintegrate. And I make sure that that doesn't happen as much as possible to the museum's collection. So agents of deterioration is a big topic. And so like what is going to harm your items, whether that's a photograph, a wedding dress, um, a land deed from your family, um, newspaper clippings, um, all kinds of quilts, all kinds of things. What is going to harm them? So the major thing that's going to harm them is light. Um, sunlight and UV light um, and fluorescent light bulbs that many people still have in their homes are very damaging to these items. It causes uh, discoloration and um, fading of even furniture and furniture varnish. Um, it just really fades things very quickly. So if you put anything like, um, like a piano, I have seen a beautiful piano um, that had a lace doily on it and it was sitting near a window. It was beautiful. Um, but over time, the sunlight going through the lace um, faded the um, wood of the piano. And so when you took the lace doily away, you could still see the lace doily there. Um, so that is really what light damage does. It causes a variety of, of reactions and fading to happen in objects. So really light is a big one. Um, use, just using it and handling it um, will often cause things to break. I know because I have small children. And so um, really, if you want something to remain as pristine as possible, it's really just using it as the least amount as possible um, and handling it as little as possible. Another big one is pests, bugs. Um, so a lot of historic items are made of natural materials and bugs really love them. Um, quilts and, and textiles of cotton, wool, um, furs. They're all things that bugs really love to eat, um, especially documents, paper. Um, if you have something that's um, um, old enough, that's vellum even, that's very old, um, but leather, things that bugs will just love to eat these natural things. Um, and so just monitoring those and making sure that bugs don't come in anywhere near them is really important. Um, <clears throat> Temperature and humidity control is also very important. In Indiana, we know that it can be 20 degrees in the morning and 85 in the afternoon. And those large temperature swings are really not good for artifacts. And um, it, for things like wood, it can cause wood to swell and shrink. And if you do that enough, very often swell, shrink, swell, shrink, it'll cause things to break. And um, so really making sure that the temperature and the humidity especially is also under control. Um, the temperature needs to be 
around about between 65 degrees Fahrenheit and uh, 75 degrees Fahrenheit. And anything above that is really too warm. And then for humidity, it really needs to be between a 40 and 50% relative humidity. And that just keeps everything as stable as possible. That's also where humans are pretty comfortable. So it's a lot of um, where you're comfortable is usually where the items are comfortable. Um, so uh, a basic tip is don't put your most treasured items in an attic or a basement. Um, typically attics are not air conditioned and basements are not air conditioned, heated, cooled, um, or humidity controlled. So these spaces get really hot in the summer and really cold in the winter, or in basements, they get like cold and damp and dank. And this can all just really deteriorate items even, even more quickly. So making sure that your items that you love are kept close to you, um, somewhere inside your home. Um, typically, I put my items in closets, bedroom closets, or underneath the bed. That way they are um, in the same temperature and humidity as I am, which is what keeps most items comfortable. Um, it's also important that you check your items regularly and you do so with clean hands. So if you want to keep things like photographs and um, other documents like that, you'll want to make sure that you have clean hands when you handle everything um, and then checking them regularly. So regularly is not like weekly. Um, you'll want to check them twice a year, you know, just to make sure if it's something that you have in storage, um, just to make sure that bugs haven't decided to move in or any other critters. Um, you can also check and make sure that um, mold has not decided to grow on anything. And, um, and then if, if something has happened, you can take care of it very quickly. And you can um, hopefully go to a conservator who could help you. And then you can tell them, the last time I looked at this was this, this date. And so I know this activity has happened sometime between these, the last six months. And so I'll be able to, um, you know, not let the damage get any, any further. Um, and then also, like I said, just handling items as little as possible. Um, and there are different methods to do that um, in conservation and, and in museums is um, such as framing things. And then we have some other um, storage items that make them visible. So I can share those with you later. Um, but they, it's just handling them will, you know, can cause tears and um, fingerprints. If you don't have clean hands, fingerprints can um, smudge photographs and other metal work and things like that that can um, further damage um, the oils on our hands can further damage the items. So um, now that we've got some basic tips done, I'm going to go over some documents. So when handling documents, it's important that you handle them as little as possible and um, to store them correctly. So if you have a document, um, say I have this newspaper clipping about the full of pep store in Bloomington. Um, and so I have this newspaper clipping and I want to keep it forever. And so uh, I'm going to handle it as little as possible. I have just washed my hands, um, so I can touch it, but I'm going to handle it as little as I can. So, um, you know, on the edges and try not to rip anything. Um, but it's important that if it does rip, you don't use tape. Tape, uh, the adhesive in tape, which makes it sticky, um, will just is a chemical that will continue to eat at paper, at photographs, at newspaper clippings. It will just eat it away. So if you want to keep it forever, do not use tape. Um, also, do not laminate it. That is also not good. The lamination will also continue to eat at, eat away at this, and you will never be. Able, it will just disintegrate. Um, so paper clips and staples are also not ideal. Um, they work for the short term. Um, but paper clips, metal paper clips, when they get into a situation of high humidity, they tend to rust. And so, you know, you get those like rusty paper clips at the top of papers, and then you've got a rust mark on paper. So um, that's not ideal. So how would I keep papers together is if you have a bundle of papers, if maybe if, it, if they're not too many, you can fold a corner over and so then they will stick together. Or you can simply take a piece of paper of uh, computer paper and fold it up in half and then keep them together that way. 
four, you can get an archival folder. So these are acid free, um, basically manila folders. You can get, this is a, a ledger size, which is a large, um, large legal size uh, folder, but you can also get the normal like 11, 11 by eight and a half um, size folder as well. Um, but that's also a good way to keep pap papers safely together without using paper clips or staples. Um, so back to the newspaper clipping. Um, with the newspaper clipping that I want to keep forever about full of pep uh, store, it's the fact that it is a newspaper is problematic because newspapers are um, printed on acid, uh, on a paper with an acid inside of it. So even if I did nothing to this newspaper clipping, it will still disintegrate. Um, that is just something that newspapers do all the time, every day. They turn into a box of confetti. So uh, what, if I want to keep this newspaper clipping forever, what would be best is that I copy it, like photocopy it, like just go to an office and copy it on a print, a copier. Um, the nowadays uh, copy paper is basically acid free and the ink is very archivally stable. So you can copy the newspaper clipping and, you know, toss the newspaper clipping if you want, but um, you can also use the copy and look at that and handle the copy and then not handle the newspaper thing itself. It's also a good thing to do. Another one is this is a um, plastic uh, sleeve that uses static electricity to hold things inside of it. So I can put this newspaper clipping in here just like this and it will float in there and I can then continue to look at it. Um, I can handle the plastic, look at it, read it, share it, look, you know, share, but I'm still not handling the newspaper clipping itself. Um, that will, this plastic sleeve will not prevent the newspaper from turning into confetti. Um, nothing will prevent that, but it will prolong it as long as possible. So that's always good. Um, so if I have, say I have a whole box full of family documents, birth certificates, wedding licenses, all of these things, all of numerous newspaper clippings, all of this stuff. And I, how do I want to store these? Typically, I would say put them into folders, label them very clearly, and then you can put them into acid-free boxes. So this is a uh, ledger size box, which fits my folder very nicely. Um, but they also come in that eight and a half by 11 size as well. So you don't have to get one that's quite this big. Um, as you can see, it's just, with this piece of paper, it's quite a bit bigger. But it also is nice because historic documents can um, often be this size rather than everything being the eight and a half by 11. So historic documents are sometimes larger, which is why we tend to have the larger um, ledger size folders, but um, putting them, ooh, putting all of your folders inside your boxes, everything labeled, will make everything happy and hunky-dory. And then put your boxes either on an upper shelf in the closet, um, underneath the bed, something like that, something that's dark, not in direct sunlight, um, and something that is not someplace that's not going to have large temperature and humidity swings. So that's going to be nice to keep them safe. Um, also away from like water pipes, like you don't want to put it like underneath where your bathtub is on the second floor. Like in case the bathtub leaks, you don't want to lose everything. So that's also something you need to think about um, with that. So if I had, okay, so let's just say like if that happens. <clears throat> Let's just say my bathtub leaked all over my box of stuff. And what am I going to do about it now? So you're definitely, if it's a, if it's a crisis situation, like a flood, you're definitely going to want to talk to a conservator. Um, but a basic, like it got damp and I didn't notice it for a couple of weeks and now they're looking kind of weird. Um, so 
mold can grow pretty quickly. <clears throat> and um, so it's, it's important to stay on top of things and um, know where you keep your things as, as away from water as much as possible. But if you do have um, mold growing on your documents, it's important that you um, decrease the, the humidity as quickly as possible, get a dehumidifier, um, air them out. Um, like if it's a book, make sure that you leave it so its spine is down and the pages are up so they can, um, so air can circulate between the pages and um, all of the water can come out of the book. And then basically if there's mold growing, you're gonna want to possibly freeze the items so that it, kill, it stops the mold from growing. It doesn't kill the mold. Well, it kills some mold, but it, you don't, it's, a, it's, it's more of stops the mold from growing. And then you can take a vacuum or a brush and kind of brush the document as clean as possible. Um, a conservator would be able to ensure that it's completely clean, but at, at home, um, it would be able to just get it as clean as possible. And then just make sure that that doesn't happen again, because you can, if your HVAC goes out, it's one of those unbearable September days in Indiana where the humidity, it just feels like it's swimming when you're walking outside, um, you can have the mold can start up again and it could spread to your entire box of documents. So it's important that anything that you think is questionable, you isolate it and, and put it in a different box. And um, just in case that if mold starts to grow, it doesn't decide to vacation on your other items as well. So. We have a um, conservogram. So the National Park Service um, puts out these free documents called conservograms. And they are really wonderful documents to help with um, DIY conservation, preventive conservation, which is what I do here. And one of them is about treating mold on documents. And so that is another resource that we have available um, on our, in the chat. Um, photographs. So photographs are also, like documents made of paper, but also other chemicals. So um, you're also gonna wanna store photographs in a cool, dry place with acid-free folders, just like the, the documents. But I have, I use a little bit different folders. Um, so the for photographs, you really wanna handle them by the edges as much as possible because the chemical makeup of photographs um, fingerprints and oils from your hands can um, damage the image. And that, and it's very hard to reverse. A, a conservator could do that, but it's very difficult to. And so just handling them with clean hands and on the edges will ensure a longer life for your photographs. So just handling them by the edges. So how I store photographs is much like the folders, but just a, I do individual folders for photographs and that prevents scratching or um, if you have photographs that might have nicks or tears, something like that, um, it prevents them from scratching each other and potentially scratching the image away. So I like to put them in individual folders. So um, Gaylord Archival has um, these really wonderful photograph envelopes. I don't know if you can see that all that well, but they're um, paper envelopes and then I take the photograph and I put them, you know, I just store them in these little envelopes. You can't see the picture through the envelope. Um, for me, that's not necessary, but if you would like to, um, Gaylord does have plastic see-through envelopes as well. So you could, then you could see them and you would never have to take them out. Um, so that could be a benefit of that. They come in different sizes. You know, this is, one of the one of the smallest sizes, but then we've got a little bit bigger, um, and and even bigger. Um, they do. I mean, they come in many different sizes. And then I have photograph boxes. So then it depends on what size envelope. But then you just folder inside the box. Um, I really enjoy having the paper, um, because then you can write on the outside what's on the inside. Um, for me, it's important to write its number and its catalog number so I can find it. But if this is your family treasure, it might be fun to write like 
grandma's 80th birthday, um, you know, so-and-so's wedding. Like it's just, you, uh, you can write whatever you want on here. Um, and then it's in, make sure it's in pencil, not in pen. Um, and then also make sure you write it on the photograph. Itself. So handling the picture, we're, again, we're gonna handle it by the edges, but then just make sure you write it in pencil on the back of the photo too, just in case this gets separated from this. And then now we've got three generations later and we're like, what the heck is going on in this photo? I don't know. Um, so yeah, writing it on the back is important in pencil. Um, now, okay, so that's if I wanna store my photos. And what if I want to display my photos? I don't wanna put them in storage. I love them so much. So I would recommend getting them professionally framed. Um, so we use frame makers here in Bloomington. They are wonderful. They have all of the nece necessary acid-free materials. What you're going to want to do to use is a UV filtering, either glass or plexiglass. Um, obviously glass is breakable, but plexiglass is a nice option if you want to make sure that it's not going to break and it's really just as nice. Um, so plexiglass is a good option as well, but just um, they are very well trained in framing and acid free, making sure that whatever's inside here is going to remain as beautiful as the day it was made. Um, so when you hang your frames, so after you've gotten it framed, when you hang it, you're going to want to make sure that you're not hanging it in direct sunlight. Um, because even, even if you have UV filtering glass, it can, over a long period of time, um, fade the photograph inside. Um, so, and you know, UV filtering glass is not the cheapest. And so if y'all were to go out to Walmart or Michael's and get some frames just off the rack, um, those are not UV filtering glass or plexiglass. And so putting something in those and putting it in the sun, you are most definitely going to fade the photographs inside. Um, so it's just important to, to think about that when you want to display your items and you know how maybe scanning them and, and making a, a duplicate and then displaying the copy and putting the original, the one that's most precious in storage, also a good option. That is something that we do around here quite often is that we display copies or scans and not the originals. Um, okay, so now I'm gonna talk about scrapbooks. So we did get a specific question about how to handle scrapbooks. Um, and scrapbooks are difficult because they are, there's many different kinds of scrapbooks. And then it's like, how old is your scrapbook? Is that also an, another important question? But if we start off, here's a scrapbook. Um, it was a local organization. And um, this is a like the scrapbook paper that I get quite often. I'm going to pop it out real quick. And it's, um, it's like glue. It's like stripes of glue. And then you lift up this fun little plastic tab, slap in your photo, and then fold this on over again. And then voila. There we go, scrapbook page forever. Not really though, because uh, the glue that is used to make up this scrapbook page is obviously not archival. It's going to deteriorate the photos and it is really hard to get photos off of this glue. Um, sometimes if you're lucky, they will just pop right off. Other times they will not and you risk ruining the photo trying to get it off. So I would be very careful when, if you are gonna try to remove photographs from this type of scrapbook yourself. Um, and if you don't feel comfortable, then I would see a conservator and they would be able to dissolve the glue so that the photograph can come off. But this is really, this is, a, this is a, not a great situation. Um, here at the museum, we don't like to accept scrapbooks like this because they all just continue to disintegrate. So what we do is we scan them. So you have the digital copy of all the photos. You have the copy of the arrangement even if you know they add um, 
you know, fun, unique characteristics. Um, and we'll have the digital copy of that and then we can give the original back to the donor. Um, that's typically what we do is just because there's so many photographs and it's so difficult to get them out of this scrapbook that they'll just continue to disintegrate. So that's one that, uh, scrapbook that I see quite often. Um, if you have an even older scrapbook, so around the turn of the 20th century, um, between about 1880 and, 18, and 1930, that like 50 year range, um, cabinet cards were a very popular form of family memento um, portrait photography. And, um, and then photo albums came along to store them. So this is a large photo album that was made around about 1880. Um, it's got leather, decorated leather on the front, a metal closure here on the side. Um, it's got, met met I don't know if you can tell that that's a little bit of a shimmer to the pages there. Um, but then the pages, see, it's already come apart. Um, the pages are designed to hold these cabinet cards. So you probably have, these things are probably inside of this album. We have, because of the extent of the damage to this album, we have removed everything from this album. But if you, you could keep your photographs in here if you like, just know that they will start to yellow and discolor because of the acid that's in the paper, the acid that's in the glue holding the spine together, um, the chemicals and the photos, everything's really just not, they don't like each other all that much. And so they will just continue as time goes on to fall apart. So we have removed everything um, from the album. And what's generally important in the album is not the album itself, it's the information that's in the album. So if you know who, you know, say this is Uncle Joe from 1880, um, it's important that on the back of the card, you write the name in pencil, because that's generally what the, what the important information in the albums are. Okay. All right, so that was, oh, I would do wanna say, um, if you would choose to keep everything in, your, in the album that you want, the album is important itself, um, you can interleave, so you can put um, like one page and then put unbuffered tissue paper. So you can put a, a page of unbuffered tissue paper, then the next page, then tissue, then, then the next page, then tissue. That's called interleaving. And so um, you can interleave some acid-free unbuffered tissue paper in between each pages too. And that will, that will help. It won't prevent things, but it will help. Next, we have Tecta. Um, so we store textiles in a variety of different ways um, at the History Center. So uh, often our clothing collection is stored in acid-free boxes. Um, Gaylord Archival has um, gar large, I can't remember what they're called, quilt boxes or textile boxes, they're big. Um, and so you can buy large boxes with tissue paper, and uh, I think they even have a kit that comes with tissue paper, which is nice. Um, but you can just fold your clothes, put them in with the tissue paper, and then just store them under a bed, in a closet, that sort of thing. Um, and then just regularly check them. You are going to want to take the lid off the boxes to check them. So um, you can, it can get some, a little bit of air circulation before you shut it. And again, um, boxes like keepsake boxes for wedding dresses are really not good long-term. You're gonna want the dress to come out and breathe. And then oftentimes um, in the, you know, around, I would say the 1950s to 1970s and then you get into the 80s when I guess that's still very popular, then um, the dry cleaners would often include plastic or something in there that um, is not archival, like a not good archival plastic, like a bad dry cleaner plastic. 
And so you're not going to want to that to stay in there forever um, next to your beloved wedding dress. If you would like your daughter or daughter-in-law to wear it, um, you're not going to want to store it in a keepsake dry cleaner box. Um, you will want a acid-free um, textile conservation kind of box, which can be very large. Um, so what another uh, way to do that, which is, this is how we store wedding dresses, is hanging them. So we hang the wedding dresses on um, padded hangers that look like this. So it's a metal hanger and then it has um, unbleached cotton muslin uh, around the outside. And on the inside is cotton fiber fill, like you would for a quilt or stuff a pillow, something like that. You can get them at Joann's. You can get both of these at Joann's. Um, and then wrap the hanger. And so it's padded and, and comfy and you're not, the garment isn't resting directly on the hanger. And then we have, uh, so the dress, a lovely wedding dress here. Um, it's on a hanger and then it's also underneath a dust cover. So this is also made of cotton muslin um, and it's it's actually like basically a dry cleaner bag, but there's a slit in the front so we can get it over, over the top of the dress. And it's the entire length of the dress, front and back. We've got a little bit of a shoulder seam here, but yeah, it's a nice dust cover with the unbleached cotton muslin to help um, and then hang it. And so this just lets air continue to flow through. A dry cleaner bag with the plastic does not allow air to flow through. So if there's any kind of mold in there, it's just gonna keep growing and growing and growing. Um, but this allows for air to come in and out and um, um, dust to not accumulate on your um, wonderful heirloom textile. Okay, so those are, that would be a wedding dress or any court sort of dress, prom dress, suits, um, uniforms, military uniforms. Um, we do that as well. Um, but say I have a quilt, what do I do with my quilt? So I'm gonna use this baby blanket as a fake quilt. Um, so you can fold quilts and put them in archival boxes or into, um, I have a cedar chest at home, um, but I make sure that the quilt does not touch the cedar of the chest. That's important because the cedar, the wood is acidic and it will stain um, and discolor any sort of fabrics that it comes in contact with for a very long time. And you will need to talk to a conservator to fix that. Um, but how you would want to fold it is if it's very fragile, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you pad the seams of your fold. And now what does that mean, pad the seams? So um, these are very crude, but you're going to wanna to get some sort of um, like a snake. It looks like a snake. So you're gonna take unbleached cotton muslin and make a tube with cotton fiber fill. So this is bubble wrap because this is a demonstration. Um, but you're gonna want the cotton muslin snake with cotton fiber fill, and it's gonna pad the seams. So um, I'm gonna fold this uh, blanket as I would a quilt from our collection. So I'm gonna put one snake right here, another one right here. I'm gonna take this seam and go over it this way. So you can see that the um, quilt is not, completely folded in half. There's not a very flat, harsh crease that's gonna come into the quilt. So that's what these do. They prevent creasing, which could break the, the fibers of the quilt. So we're gonna do that again. Onto that side. And then we would also do this again this way. Well, we're just gonna do that. And then fold it like that. So this is a little less glamorous, but um, this would be a good way to store something in a box. 
so that when you pull it out, there are no creases in the quilt and the fibers remain intact and they're not partially broken or could get broken when you fold and crease something um, in the quilt. Another way to store it is just simply roll. Um, that is a good option. And if it's something that's like so very large. So we have quite a few very, very large quilts that we store rolled. Um, you're gonna wanna get uh, a large tube. It could be, it could be a, car, a large cardboard tube, but then you might wanna wrap it um, with like a, a archival safe plastic and then maybe some cotton, maybe some um, polyester fiber fill, something like that to pad it, give it a little love. And then you can always roll, that's, that's gonna be our pretend tube. And then just simply roll the quilt and store, store roll. Um, if you would like to hang your quilt, I know that that's often um, a way that people want to display something, um, is that that's fine. Quilts, you can put, um, what's it called now? Um, a sleeve on the back, a hanging sleeve. And you just make sure that you display any, anything, any quilt, any textile away from direct sunlight, like absolutely no direct sunlight that will discolor it. And um, you're gonna wanna check it frequently for dust um, if it's hanging. And to take care of dust, you'll just want to vacuum it occasionally. Um, if it's fragile, you'll want to low suction vacuum it. Um, and just make sure that you're careful that if there's anything adorning it, you're not gonna suck that off, anything like that. Um, just making sure that you're careful when you do that. But vacuuming any dust would be important to do regularly. Okay. Um, we did get a question from somebody ahead of time about smell, that they had a wedding dress that um, even after they aired it out, it still smelled. That's common, especially if you were to inherit something from a smoker. Um, and so getting that smell out can take a lot of time, a lot of time. Um, but what's something that does help and speed along the process is um, kitty litter. Um, so that's fun. What you do is um, you kind of create a, um, a sealed chamber. And what I have done is um, I've made, I've taken like a coat rack and I have covered the coat rack in like a heavy plastic and then duct taped it close. So it was sealed. Everything was sealed inside. And then you put a tray of kitty litter inside, maybe one to two inches of kitty litter. And then the garment is hanging above. Um, so, you know, it was a coat, it was a large coat rack. Um, so then every, it was every week, I would stir the kitty litter and just make sure that the dress doesn't touch the kitty litter, but I would stir the kitty litter so that new uh, crystals and new um, odor absorbing crystals that kitty litter has um, would be uh, fresh to take more odors out of the garment. And that worked really well. I think I kept the dress in there for, I think it was something like three or four months and I turned it weekly and it was like nice when it came out. So hopefully that will help. If you do not have a coat rack, you can't do something like that. You can take a large Tupperware, like a large plastic tote and kind of do the same thing. You just might have to rig something up where your dress, if it was folded, um, which is also fine to fold the dress, um, wasn't touching the kitty litter. So if there was like some sort of like, like a, like a cookie drying rack um, that you would put over it so that the dress wouldn't touch the kitty litter, um, using that would also help. And then you might want to occasionally fold the dress a different way so that more um, fabric was exposed at a different time um, and that would help get some, some of the smells out. So hopefully that's a good and pretty cheap way to get some smells out. Um, so toys and metals and plastics. So this is like, okay, I have a beloved toy that I played with 
and I want to keep it forever. I have a teddy bear or a doll. Um, so these are also often things that people want to save. Um, and saving these can be um, difficult based on what they are made of. Um, the, the basic advice I would have for objects would be to just store them in a cool, dry, dark place and make sure that you dust them regularly. Um, so if I have this lovely little doll here, she is a composite doll. So she has a fiber, a very stiff fiber body. And then her hands, her feet, and her head are the only thing that is ceramic about her. Um, so she's stuffed with natural fibers, which would attract a bug, like it's nobody's business. And so that is important to make sure that you monitor them and make sure that no bugs get in there. Um, but really just making sure she's in a dark spot that's uh, dry and no humidity gets to her um, because the humidity can affect the glazing of, um, of her face and hands and um, really just affect the natural fibers inside her body. Um, and then mold, you might get, you know, humidity can always breed mold. So you never know where mold is, it's crazy. Um, the same goes with a stuffed animal, a stuffed, like the stuffed bear. Um, it's just, you're not going to, you're gonna to wanna to keep them somewhere dark so that the fur does not continue to fade. And then dusting is important. So how do I dust? a bear um, is a good question. And you're gonna want to use um, a low suction vacuum to occasionally run it over the fur or even just hover above the fur so you don't actually have to touch the fur, um, but um, dusting the bear is important. And just make sure that there's no sunlight. They're not getting into any sunlight. Um, We did get a question. We're going to go back really quick to textiles because we did get a question about wool baby booties and a baby wool hat um, and how to preserve those. And um, so basically keeping them somewhere like a cedar chest would be great, but just like any other textile, making sure they're in an acid-free box and have, um, you know, no sunlight, temperature and humidity is good as well. Um, but for the booties, because it's like a three-dimensional thing, you're going to want to add an internal support. So this is a tiny little, um, I guess it's sausage support, um, but it's a tube of, it's cotton muslin, and then it's stuffed with fiber fill. And it's just a little, I don't know, a little sausage thing. And, um, but it's made to go inside the booty because it's a soft-sided um, object, just so that the booty keeps its form. Otherwise it's gonna just sit and go flat and like will never ever keep its shape if it's stuck like this forever. So making sure that it has that internal support is important. Um, you can do this also for hard-sided shoes if you wanted to, just to make sure that they keep their form. And then like knee-high boots, I know that, um, World War I uniforms often had knee-high boots, and so you can make large, tall supports that go down into um, the shoe that will hold the boot up. I'm not sure, but I think maybe Gaylord might have something like that. I'm not sure. I haven't looked, but you can look if that's something that you're interested in. Okay. All right. Metals. Um, metals was a question is like how to preserve a horseshoe and horse nails. That was a question that came in ahead of time. And um, it kind of depends on the metal and the environment. So there's, that was a difficult question to attack because it's so broad. Um, like how do I preserve a metal? But a horseshoe, um, a horseshoe is generally depending on what it's made of. Nowadays it's generally made of um, like a steel or aluminum. Um, which is, you know, much more 
conservation friendly than um, what it has been in the past, which um, was like a, a bronze. Um, and they tend to rust very easily. And a small a, a layer of rust is actually good and that can pr protect the metal underneath of it from continuing to rust. So it'll like cover itself in rust, but then it will like stop rusting. So that's actually good. Um, but if it's in a place of high humidity, it will just continue to eat away and then it'll flake off and you'll get these like tons of little rust flakes around. And then that's when you have an, what's called active corrosion. And it's, it's not gonna stop until the humidity stops. Um, so making sure that whatever you wanna keep, if, if it is a horseshoe like this one, that it's in a dry environment, typically um, the drier, the better. If it's like under 30% humidity, is really a good place. So like, if you're thinking like the desert, um, you know, that's like, gosh, I used to watch like, what's that show? Like American Pickers, where they would always go to like the desert and find like really good cars that were just a little bit rusty and they would fix up. Well, it's because it's so dry in the desert that they are in really, they stay in really good shape. Um, so it's the drier, the humidity is better. And then when you handle any kind of metals, if it's like, you know, a silver tea set, um, a silver tray, something like that, you're gonna wanna make sure that your hands are clean or you're wearing gloves. Like it's important to prevent fingerprints on, on those sorts of things. Silver tarnishes very easily, but a layer of tarnish actually protects the rest of the silver from continuing to de deteriorate. So a layer of tarnish is fine. And we have silver, in the collection and it has a layer of tarnish on it, but then I leave it. And unless we want to display the item, if I display it, then I'm gonna clean the tarnish off. But until that moment that we want to display it, I'm gonna leave the tarnish on because the tarnish is actually saving it. So um, that's one of the weird things about metal. But yeah, if you have other questions about metal, feel free to ask me, but it's um, there's a wide range of things to do with metal. Okay, plastic. I do not have a plastic example, but um, plastics like Barbie dolls, um, other just plastic, general plastic toys, you know, like pop guns or something like that. Um, it's just important to keep an eye on them and keep them in a, in a dry, dark location. Um, they can off gas because they are, plastic is made of just chemicals. And so the chemicals can, react to each other and, and um, continue to deteriorate over time. There was a period of time in the 1950s that plastics were made that were actually very unstable. Those are discontinued now, but they break down very easily. They get those spider webbing, that's um, deterioration. Um, and so it's just important that you uh, monitor them pretty regularly. And if you do start to see like spider webbing, or it just snaps, breaks off, um, and is just very fragile. Just coloring um, isn't important. If it gets sticky, if your plastic gets like a Barbie doll, if it gets sticky to the touch, that's when you know that it's the chemicals, the plastic is deteriorating. Um, then it's important to isolate it from, every, from other plastic because it's what's called off-gassing. And the off-gassing can the gases can affect other plastics and cause them to break down more quickly. Um, so it's important to just separate those from others um, that are not deteriorating. Um, so yeah, there's, uh, there's a lot of things that you can do easily at home to help preserve your family treasures, um, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, I don't know if there are questions <laughs> in the chat. Um, but I'm happy if anybody has any questions, you can just put them in the chat. And I have um, my coworker, Andrea, is here helping me um, manage those. But I'm happy um, to answer any questions. And you can also email them to me if you think of them later. Um, my email is collection at monroehistory.org. So thank you very much. I hope that was very informative. I went through a lot very quickly. Um, do we have any questions, Andrea? Not at this time. Okay. Um, I can go over some supplies. So I have, did I bring the catalog over here? 
Oh, well, this book is a great resource. You can put this out there. Um, Caring for Your Family Treasures, quick and easy guide, obviously made for the non-museum person. Just anybody who's um, interested in caring for their um, family treasures. So you, that's always a great book. Um, this is the like a, a length of the unbleached cotton muslin. This stuff is amazing. And it's just so nice to use and wrap things in, prevent dust, um, make stockinettes, make padded hangers, all kinds of things um, with the cotton muslin. Um, you can go to Gaylord Archival. Um, that will, I mean, they have so many supplies at Gaylord Archival. Things that I, I often purchase from Gaylord Archival, but there's like, there's things that not everybody needs at Gaylord. Um, but uh, you can also get like uh, the cotton muslin at Joanne Fabrics in town. Um, I'm not sure if Michael has it. I haven't been, Michael does have it. Um, and then where else did I find it? Well, Amazon, we bought a whole bunch on Amazon. So um, yeah, you can get a whole bunch there as well. Um, lots of boxes of various sizes. We've got, we didn't talk at all about um, video or CDs and that sort of thing. Maybe we'll do that another time, but yeah. We do have a question. Okay. Do you have any recommendations for taxidermied animals? Okay, so we had a question on, do you have, any recommendations for taxidermied animals? Okay, so um, it depends on when, how old your taxidermy is. If it's a very recent taxidermied animal, that's great because it's made with all safe materials right now. But if there is a time period, I think it's before 1950, but I can't remember that year yet. Um, but they used to be stuffed with arsenic. That was like a thing. So you're gonna want, to make sure that if you have a very old piece of taxidermy, that it's not harmful to handle. Um, it's it, That wouldn't be something that you should be like deathly afraid it's on your wall. Um, but if you want to handle it, you should make sure that it's not got arsenic inside. And a taxidermist will help you be able to determine that. So it would just be getting, calling a taxidermy. Um, with the taxidermy, um, one of the main problems is bugs because it is, it was an animal. And um, so it's got the, the hair follicles, um, the fur that bugs love to eat, moths, all kinds of it, like obviously the leather, the skin. Um, and so it's got a lot of components that bugs will be attracted to. So it's important to make sure that you, it's not, um, that bugs are not getting into it. And then light is an, another issue. If, you, if it's in sunlight or even just like, light bulbs in general. So if you have it in your living room and um, you know, occasionally you're gonna want to check out the fur and just make sure that it's not faded. Um, that's actually happened to our bear, um, Monroe the bear, his fur, he's been on display since, you know, forever now. And um, his fur had faded because of the light. He's not in direct sunlight, but his, but the light um, faded his fur color. So we had a taxidermist come in and basically recolor his hair. Um, and, and it was very, very easy. Just kind of like how uh, women go to the salon and get their hair colored. It was the same sort of product for Monroe. It was very nice. He had a spa day. Um, but I would say if you're not going to display your taxidermy and you want to just store the taxidermy, um, you would want to put it obviously somewhere that was temperature and humidity controlled, somewhere that you checked it regularly for bugs. And then something had, like you took some muslin and made like a, like a dust cover thing, like a tarp almost out of the muslin so that dust doesn't get into the fur because that can also deteriorate the fur. Um, and just making sure that the humidity doesn't swing because that can cause the leather to crack um, and uh, just making sure that you check it pretty regularly. I would say like, you know, two or three times a year, just check and make sure that everything's okay. So yeah, taxidermy, <laughs> interesting. <laughs>
Okay, do we have any other questions? I do not see any others in the chat. Okay, well, um, you can always uh, shoot me an email. Um, I'm here at the History Center and um, I hope that this was informative um, and just let me know if you have any further questions, but thank you all very much for joining us for How Do I Preserve This, Our Family Treasures.